begin. So tonight we're going to begin the study that you see on the television up here. The title of it is Freemasonry. Should a Christian be a Freemason? And I have the Bible verse on the title page here. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets. If there's one thing that the Masons and secret societies are known for, it's secrets. But tonight and next Sunday night, we're going to reveal all their secrets. Much to their disdain, I'm sure, uh, we're going to just let the cat out of the bag. We're going to share as many of their secrets as we have time to share. Uh, you're going to see and hear about a lot of things that you've probably heard about in the past. You're going to see and hear about things, though, that you did not know were associated with the Masons, undoubtedly. I doubt that there's anyone here who is not going to learn something about the Masons that you did not already know. Uh, there is plenty of information to share, and so we're going to uh, have to move quickly as we go through it. I want to say, though, in starting, that I can remember as a boy, when I was about 9 or 10 years old, the little country Baptist church that I grew up in uh, had two qualifications in the church constitution for pastors and deacons there at that little church that were in addition to the biblical qualifications for a pastor and deacon. And I remember this distinctly because when I was, like I say, nine or ten years old, there was a man who was a deacon in the church that one of these two issues came up about, and that was uh, this part of the church constitution was read from the pulpit. I don't know who the man was. I was just a, a boy at the time. But the two qualifications to be a pastor or a deacon at that little country Southern Baptist church, wasn't even an independent Baptist church, were, number one, you could not uh, drink alcohol or give alcohol to anybody else. And that was an issue that came up because that particular deacon owned a little convenience store and he started selling alcohol. So they told him he couldn't be a deacon anymore or he had to get rid of the alcohol. He chose the alcohol over being a deacon, best I recall. Uh, the, uh, the other thing, though, in the church constitution was that no pastor or deacon of the church could be a member of any secret society. As a 9 or 10 year old boy, I didn't even know what a secret society was. And it wasn't until years later that I became acquainted with the Masons uh, and a little bit about what they believe. And as time went along, I learned more about who they are and what they believe. I, I need to say as a disclaimer starting out, I am not a Mason, nor have I ever been a Mason. Uh, some, somebody asked me this week, you know, you really think you ought to be talking about what the Masons believe if you're not a Mason. And as I told them, well, I preach on hell too, but I've never been there either. And uh, so as a Baptist preacher, my job is to tell the truth wherever it is, whatever it's about, whether I've been there or participated in it or not. And I'm thankful there are a lot of things that I'm supposed to preach about that I have not participated in. Amen? Amen. So I, I am not a... Mason, never have been a Mason. Uh, I have been associated with four people very close to me in my lifetime that were Masons. One of them died a Mason. Two of them were Masons and left the Masons once they realized what it was all about. And the fourth one was given the opportunity to become a Mason and then once he uh, saw a little bit about it, he declined to go any further and did not officially become a Mason. So no, I have not been a Mason. I have had some very close people in my life who were or were associated with the Masons, however. But the material that I'm going to share with you tonight and next Sunday night has nothing to do with my opinion about anything. You're going to see and hear for yourself from the words of the Masons themselves about what they believe. And so uh, at that, I'm going to move to our next slide here. This is part one that we're going to talk about tonight. The title for part one is The Secrets About Masons That Most People Want to Know. These are the things you've heard a little bit about and you probably know a little bit about that goes on. And so we're going to just, I'm going to do my very best to just disclose all their secrets that I can disclose to you. 
uh, get all of it out there so any, uh, any interest that anybody might have had in being a Mason just because they wanted to find out what the secrets are, I'm going to give them all to you so you don't have to go join the Masons to find out their secrets and what they do there. We're going to talk about those handshakes, the passwords, all those kind of things. And uh, I'm sure there are a lot of Masons that are not going to be happy uh, with what we're doing because we're not only going to do it for those that are here tonight, we're going to put it online and anybody and everybody all over the world that wants to see it will be able to see it for themselves. I have, uh, over the course of the last week, uh, I've had a couple of people that knew we were going to be doing this particular topic tonight for our Bible study, and they asked me out of, I think, genuine concern, aren't you worried uh, about doing something like this because uh, uh, you might come under attack because Masons hold some very high positions in local, state, national, and international capacities. Uh, my answer to them is the same thing my answer always is as a preacher, and that is uh, I serve a God who's a lot higher than anybody else is, and I only answer to Him. And so uh, that's why I'm going to share with you what I'm going to share with you. I'm sharing it with you because, number one, as your pastor, I want to make sure that I'm doing my due diligence in protecting my flock so that my flock knows uh, what the Masons are, what they believe, lest at some point you or some of your family members get drawn into the Masons or are thinking about uh, joining the Masons. I want you to know up front who they are, what they believe beforehand uh, so that you can make an, an educated decision before you get caught up in something that you don't know what it is until it's too late. I also want to say, before I move to the next slide here, uh, it is not my intention to be unkind or ugly to anybody that either is a Mason or has friends or relatives that might be Masons. My desire is to share the truth. The Bible says that the truth shall set you free. I'm going to share the truth. You can do with it as you will. And those that you share it with, they can do with it as they will also. The question. Notice that the title of this study is not can a Christian be a Freemason? That's not the title. The, the title of our Bible study tonight is Should a Christian be a Mason? So, you know, this is not uh, a question of, well, does that mean if I become a Mason that I'm not a Christian anymore or I lose my salvation? You know that this Baptist preacher preaches and teaches every single week that once you're saved, if you're truly born again, you're saved, you're eternally saved. You can't lose your salvation. So the question is not, uh, can a Christian be a Mason, but should a Christian be a Mason? There's a difference between the two. Should a Christian be a Mason? Before we begin, several things I'll point out to you. I already alluded to some of these. Number one, most Masons will not appreciate you trying to share this information with them. So if you know some Masons and you take all this stuff you're going to learn over the next two weeks and you try to go to them and share it with them, number one, they're not supposed to reveal any of their secrets, so they're probably not going to admit that you're right about anything you share with them. But number two, they're not going to appreciate you trying to uh, tell them that what they're doing is wrong. And that's just human nature. That's the way any of us are. Any of us, if uh, somebody approaches us about something we're a part of or something we're doing, our immediate instinct is to say, uh, listen, I, I don't want to listen to what you have to say. I don't agree with you. I'm not going to listen to it. So don't be surprised if you try to share this information with someone who is a Mason if they don't even want to listen to what you have to say. So you're going to have to be, as Jesus said, wise as serpents but harmless as doves as you try to discerningly share this information with them. Maybe it's best to do it in the form of asking them questions uh, to try to get them to see the truth for themselves. Secondly of all, sharing this information will not make you popular, especially among the movers and shakers in your community. It is not how to win friends and influence people. Some of the, the most powerful people in government at every level are Masons. And so uh, trying to uh, pull the veil back, trying to open the door and shed light on the things we're going to talk about, 
it is not something that's going to make you any friends uh, with the country club crowd. Number three, most Masons you know do not know everything you're about to learn. A large part of what we're going to cover, especially next week, are things that the average Mason that you might know, he probably does not even know what I'm going to tell you about. So don't be surprised if he acts like we don't believe that, we, uh, Masons don't teach that, because most Masons don't even know what they believe and what uh, Freemasonry is all about. Number, number next one, number four. Every Mason you know knows some of what you're about to learn. While, while most Masons you know probably don't know everything you're, you're going to hear in the next two weeks, all of the Masons you know know some of what we're going to talk about. And all of the Masons that you know know enough that if they're a Christian, they should know better than to be a part of it. Uh, again, I'm not saying that to condemn anyone or to throw stones. It's simply a fact. Every Mason you know is going to know everything I share with you tonight in the first part of this Bible study. And then the last one here, just because you think you know the answer to our original question, should a Christian be a Mason? You should not settle on your final answer until you've seen the evidence which will be presented. The Bible says, He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Proverbs 18, 13. So I say that because I'm hoping that even though there are no Masons here tonight perhaps, that in the future some Masons will listen to this Bible study. And my hope is that they will hear all the evidence presented and then make their own decision, but not make a decision until they've seen it and heard it all for themselves. So what does the Bible say? 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. I learned that verse at, uh, at the Wilds Christian Camp up in Brevard, North Carolina when I was in seventh grade. And I've remembered that verse every, ever since. It's a good verse. You ought to memorize it if you don't know it. And then 1 Corinthians 10 verse 23 says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. That verse means that as a Christian, I might be free to do whatever I want to do, but that doesn't mean that everything I could do is what I ought to do. There are some things I could do, but it may not be best for me to do them. My purpose and greatest desire in this life should be to get glory for God through me and through my life. Everything else in this life should be secondary to pleasing and glorifying Him. There's nothing that is either equal nor more important than this. My number one goal ought to be to be well-pleasing in His sight. And if we make that the goal, the standard by which we judge whether we should or shouldn't do anything, we'll all be better off in our Christian walk. Here's the answer to that question. So then the issue should not be whether I can be a Freemason and still be saved, but instead whether being a Freemason hinders me from being what I can and should be for the Lord Jesus Christ. If being a Freemason in any way diminishes my service, my witness, or my devotion to Him, even one tiny bit, I must answer, no, I should not be a Freemason. By the way, that same principle applies to a lot of other things in life too. If anything we're doing in our Christian life diminishes our service, our witness, or our devotion to Him, we shouldn't do those things either. Okay, are you ready to begin our quest? Are you prepared to be honest with yourself and with God about this subject of the Masons? I've listed some reason that men join the Masons. You say, well, preacher, you're not a Mason. You've never been a Mason. How do you know the reasons that some men join the Masons? Well, I know because I've known a lot of Masons over the years. Here are some of the reasons I've heard some of them give. Number one, uh, my, my daddy was a Mason. So if their father or grandfather, uncle or brother was a Mason, they're more likely to be a Mason themselves if a family member has men. Number two, to learn how to become a better man. In fact, that's the motto of the Masons is making good men better. Number three, to do good philanthropic deeds for their fellow man. 
I mean, let's face it, the, the Masons do do some good things for people. Uh, the Shriners hospitals and other things as well, they do some philanthropic things for the good of their communities. Number four, I suspect this is the reason for a lot of them, to climb the social and business ladder in the community. It's the same reason they go to that big church down the road too with the, the chandeliers and the ball fields and all that uh, because they're trying to climb that ladder. I didn't mention any names, Brother John. All right, uh, no, number five. Some, some men join the Masons to learn the secret, mysterious knowledge so that they can gain some advantage in their business, their life, their family, uh, or politics. Now, I'm going to tell you what all their mysterious knowledge is over the course of tonight and next Sunday. So you're going to know what it is. You don't need to join the Masons to know what those things are. I'm going to give you all of that, and I'll answer any questions you have after we're through with the two weeks, too. Number six... To achieve salvation and spiritual success without going to church. I'm just going to be honest with you. I've known more than a few Masons that they were at the Masonic Lodge every time there was a lodge meeting. But those fellows, you'd be hard-pressed to find them every Sunday in their local church like they ought to be. The number seven, this might be it for a lot of them too, to get away and spend time with the boys. They just want to get away and spend time with other men. All right, so. I have entitled this slide a likely response. A mason that's hearing the things that we're going to present in this study will likely deny all of the things I'm going to tell you for one of two reasons. The first reason is he takes seriously his oaths to keep the rites and rituals of Freemasonry a secret. So he will go to great lengths to discredit both the message and the messenger in order to get others to believe that what is contained in this presentation is all lies, thus causing others to believe that there's no truth in it and thus preserving the secrets of masonry. And I'm going to tell you, they, it, it would not be unusual for you to present any of the information I'm going to share with you with a mason and say, hey, is this true? If he's a good mason... He's not supposed to tell you whether it's true or not. He's supposed to keep it a secret. And he's in trouble if he says, yes, that is, one of, that, that is true about the Mason. So, so if you ask them a question about whether some of what I'm presenting is true, the average Mason is not going to tell you yes or no. He's not supposed to. Or the other response you'll get is this. He genuinely does not yet know what he has gotten himself into with Freemasonry. And he's going to be as caught off guard by what he sees and hears in this presentation as everybody else is. Nobody, though, wishes to believe that he has been misled and duped into believing things that are not true. I mean, let's face it. If if you found out that you were wrong in something you had believed for a long time, doesn't that make you feel a little bit stupid, embarrassed? Uh, I know when I learned some things about biblical cosmology that the Bible teaches that I should have known and believed a long time ago, I felt really dumb for not having just believed the Bible in the beginning. Uh, Well, that's the response you might get from a mason who doesn't even realize yet what he's gotten himself into. He may even feel ashamed and embarrassed. The natural response for anyone in this situation is to be offended, be defensive, and to vehemently deny that these things are so, even if they are so. There's little hope for the man in the first case. He's already placed his allegiance higher than the church, family, country, and even the revealed Word of God. He's given his allegiance to Freemasonry above all those others. This is one of the despicable things about Freemasonry. It removes a man's allegiance from those who should have it and puts in their place Freemasonry. Now, we're going to talk about this more next week, but that's one of the, problem, uh, one of the problems in our churches, in our government, and in the world today, in businesses today. Men who are Freemasons have given Masonic principles and doctrine a higher allegiance in their heart and mind than these other institutions and God that should have it. And that's why we're in the situation we are today. Who are Masons? 
Well, Masons are doctors, lawyers, mechanics, teachers, professors, deacons, and even some preachers. The average Mason is a good man. And by the way, I've known, as I said, many Masons. Uh, almost to a man, not all of them, but almost to a man, I would tell you that everyone I've ever known was a good man. The average Mason would tell you that the Masons are a brotherhood designed to help good men become better men and to do philanthropic deeds to help others. An admirable goal. The average Mason believes Freemasonry is a good institution. He believes that he knows more about his craft. That's what Freemasons call Freemasonry. He believes he knows more about it than the uninitiated. That's me and you, those that are not Masons. And he will generally be offended and defensive if anyone speaks negatively about it. Uh, I have known uh, Masons who would defend the Masonic Lodge uh, faster than they would defend their church or their family or uh, something else. So, a note to Christian Masons. During this presentation, you may want to leave and not return. If you mention it to another Master Mason, he will tell you not to go back to Pinnacle Baptist Church. He will tell you that what you experienced is a profane speaking of quote, our venerated symbols and rituals, who doesn't know what he's talking about. And he would be talking about your preacher, by the way. Uh, if he's correct, though, there's nothing to lose by seeing for yourself, right? I'm not saying that to you. I'm saying that to any Mason that might be watching or listening later on. As a Christian, your greatest obligation is to be pleasing to the one who gave himself for you. Uh, uh, to Christian Masons, I would also say 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. That is our goal, our number one goal ought to be to be well-pleasing to God above all else. Masons are taught to desire, quote-unquote, light. So allow the light of the Word of God to dispel the darkness. John 8, 32 says, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you as a Baptist preacher, especially an independent Baptist preacher, uh, you won't be a bit surprised to hear me say, like I always say, that the final authority in all matters is to be the Word of God. What I think does not matter, what you think does not matter. What mama and daddy think does not matter. What the worshipful master of the local lodge thinks does not matter. But what does matter is what God thinks about anything. What God thinks is all that matters on the subject, for it is He who will judge every man one day, and it is by His Word that we will all be judged. So what we're going to do is compare what masonry says with what the Bible says, because that's the, uh, the ruler, the yardstick, by which we're all going to be measured one day. Acts 17.31 says... Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. The one who's going to be our judge one day is the one that God the Father raised from the dead, and that is Jesus himself. Psalm 119.89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So whatever the Bible says, that's what it says. Revelation 20, 12 says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. This, of course, is the great white throne judgment. It's only for lost people, and it's only to, de to determine what their judgment or degree of judgment is going to be. Now we're getting into the actual parts of Freemasonry. Masons begin their initiation into Freemasonry by becoming a member of a regular Blue Lodge. You want to keep note of the name Blue Lodge. That's what every Mason starts out in, even if he goes into one of the offshoots of Masonry later on. Every Mason starts out in the Blue Lodge. It's the first three degrees of Masonry. In the Blue Lodge, they may advance through three degrees. Number one, the Entered Apprentice degree. Number two, the Fellowcraft degree. And number three, 
the Master Mason degree. Upon completion of the Master Mason degree, though, a Mason may choose to join himself to an appendant body of Freemasonry, uh, that is a branch off the, uh, the Blue Lodge, to pursue advanced degrees. The two most notable systems in, the, in these United States are the York Rite and the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. The York Rite includes various independent orders within it, such as the Knights Templar and the Associated Order of Malta. Uh, the York Rite is more prevalent on the other side of the pond over in England and the continent of Europe than it is here in the States. Uh, the Scottish Rite is more prevalent here in the States. The Scottish Rite includes a total of 32 earned degrees with a special 33rd degree which may be bestowed honorarily upon a 32nd degree initiate who has contributed significantly to the cause of Freemasonry. Uh, I'll give you an example. There are a lot of uh, politicians, entertainers, well-known people that are uh, honorarily receive the 33rd degree in Freemasonry because just having their name associated with Freemasonry is good for Freemasonry. And so uh, the 33rd degree is usually reserved for Freemasons that have contributed in a significant way, but they don't hesitate to throw it out there to big name celebrities as well for the purposes of their own propaganda. Masonic lodges are open exclusively to men. But there are appendant Masonic organizations for women, such as the Order of the Eastern Star and others, the Rainbow Girls for daughters, and Demolay for boys. Uh, you, you may at some time or another have seen a sign, a building with a sign on it that says Order of the Eastern Star. Those are the wives of Masons who have their own Masonic organization. Now, I know when I was in high school, in the, I was still at that point in a Southern Baptist church, uh, and I went to the annual convention of the Royal Ambassadors here in Georgia, down at Lake Tobasovki in Macon, uh, where we held our annual jamboree down there. Uh, Royal Ambassadors were kind of like Boy Scouts for teenage boys in the Southern Baptist churches at the time. And uh, I was supposed to be, uh, I had won the, the, uh, the National Mission Speak Out contest to represent the state of Georgia. So I was supposed to go on stage there at the Jamboree and present my five-minute speech on missions to all the other young men that were there. And I was back behind the curtain there on the stage waiting to go out and, and give my five-minute speech on missions. And there was another Southern Baptist boy back there who was one of the quote-unquote officers in the Royal Ambassadors that year. And he was trying to recruit me to join the DMLA uh, while I was there to present my missions uh, presentation. I didn't know what DMLA was at the time. I didn't know what the Masons were at the time as far as that goes. I knew of them but didn't know what they believed. But they are actively recruiting and they actively get their children involved. They actively get their wives involved. And so this is the organization of Freemasonry. Then there are clandestine lodges. All lodges that are formed without the proper authority from the Grand Lodge of their state are deemed to be clandestine and therefore unlawful to all other Masons. Now, in every state, the Grand Lodge is the parent organization and all the local lodges in the state of Georgia are under the Grand Lodge of Georgia, for example. This means that Masons are not to interact with such lodges nor treat their members as fellow Masons upon penalty of being expunged from the Masons themselves. And until the 1990s, all Negro lodges around the country were uh, purporting to be Masonic lodges were considered clandestine in these United States. That is, the other Masons didn't recognize them as Masons. Since that late date, however, certain of the Prince Hall lodges, which are the black lodges, have been accepted by the Grand Lodges as legitimate. Uh, this is one of the things that until the 90s, uh, Masons were still... Uh, seen by the secular world as being uh, exclusive and inappropriate because they, they did not allow anyone uh, from the black lodges to be a member. Now here we're beginning to get into some of the code words, some of the v verbiage that you'll hear among Masons when they're trying to speak to each other or identify one another, even out in public. 
sitting in the east. What does that mean? The position in the lodge room where the worshipful master sits, he's, he's the head of the local lodge, is also known as the oriental chair. And the word orient, by the way, means eastern. Lodges are symbolically situated east and west. If you know of any Masonic lodges in the area, if you'll think about where they are uh, in your mind right now, they probably are designed, they've been built on an east-west axis, and whoever the worshipful master is, when they're in their, uh, in their lodge room there, uh, he's going to sit in the far east end of the building in his big chair at the end of the room. When a mason suspects that another man may be a mason out in public somewhere, and he wishes to ask him if he's a mason without doing so directly, he may ask such questions as, have you ever been to the east? Or, are you a traveling man? I know, might seem silly. But if you ever have a man come up to you men, and he asks you one of these questions, he's asking, are you a mason? He's trying to let you know he's a mason and find out if you're a mason without asking you, are you a mason, and giving himself away in case you're not. I remember one time I was preaching at a church uh, that I was not a member of. Uh, it was a fairly well-sized church, and uh, I was well-received, but after the, after the service was over, uh, a gentleman came up to me as, as folks were leaving the church, and he came up and shook my hand. He said, are you a traveling man? And at that point, I was a young man, Brother John. I was in my 20s, and I said, uh, I said well, I've been, to, uh, I've been out to Yellowstone, and I've been to such such place. He just, he just kind of shook his head and turned and walked off. He knew that I didn't know what he was saying. And at that time, I didn't realize he was trying to find out if I was a Mason. I thought it was an odd, bizarre question, but I was just answering it. I was a naive young man. But those are the questions they use, or some of the questions they use, to try to identify each other. You'll see some more coming up. Again, when a, ma when a Mason meets another man that he believes may be a brother Mason, and wishes to inquire without asking the question directly, he may use some other question that includes one or more Masonic catchphrases or words such as, Have you seen my dog Hiram? Now, who, has, who names their dog Hiram? I, I, you know, but the, the name Hiram is very significant uh, in the mythology associated with Freemasonry. So just throwing that name out there, he's trying to find out if you picked up on the buzzword. And then here's another one. Have you seen my dog with a blue collar? Well, I guess dogs wear blue collars. In fact, I used to have a, 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 a Siberian Husky with solid white, and I bought him a blue collar. That's not what they're talking about. They're trying to find out, are you from the Blue Lodge, like I'm from the Blue Lodge? It's a catchphrase that they know any Mason is going to pick up on right away. And then here's another one. How old is your grandmother or your mother? Now, what does how old your mother or grandmother is have to do with finding out if somebody's a Mason? What they're asking is, what's the lodge number of the lodge you belong to? I'm a member of lodge number 142. That would be my answer for how old my grandmother or my mother is. The average person will think these questions are odd, but will have no clue why he's being asked such a silly question just like I did that day at that church when that fellow asked me if I was a traveling man. A fellow Mason, however, will immediately pick up on the clue and give some answer which indicates that he's a fellow Mason himself. Here's the question that somebody was asking me before we got started tonight. There are two different kinds of Masons so let me clear that up before we go any further. By the way, I noticed on our Facebook page when we posted uh, about tonight's Bible study and the topic, somebody that's not from our church, I don't have a clue who they are, I saw they had asked the question, uh, are you talking about brick masons? Well, that's not what we're talking about, so let's see the difference. Operative and speculative Freemasonry. Operative masonry refers to the actual stone masons of old who designed and built structures out of stone, brick, and mortar. And by the way, there's still those kind of masons around today. Uh, that one that's uh, been working on that house over there with the crew, he's done a real fine job on those columns over there made out of brick. That looks super. That's a brick mason. That's a stone mason. That's not the kind of masons we're talking about in this Bible study. 
As they learned their craft, though, each mason passed through three levels of apprentice, journeyman, and master mason. The masons joined together later on to form guilds or lodges during the late Middle Ages. Then there's speculative masonry. That's what we're talking about tonight. Refers to men who are not literally stonemasons, but have adopted the principles of operative masons, ostensibly in order to build character instead of building stone edifices. So they would say, we've taken the principles of a stonemason, and we're using those same principles, and instead of building buildings, we're building better men. That's what they would say. These are the lodges of Freemasonry in existence today. And they still utilize many of the symbols of operative masonry, such as the apron, the square, and the compass, to illustrate their teachings. Over on the left, you see pictures of actual stonemasons doing their work building buildings. On the right, you see speculative masons, Freemasonry today. And they're, they've got all the symbology there, but none of them ever laid a brick a day in their lives. So what's a tiled lodge? We all know what a Masonic lodge is. You've seen them riding up and down the roads. What does it mean to be a tiled lodge? Sometimes seen with the archaic spelling of tiled with a Y, a tiled lodge is one which is secure and free of interlopers and eavesdroppers who are profane and uninitiated to masonry. In other words, they don't want folks like you and I that aren't masons getting in their meetings and hearing what goes on in there. So they have a man who stands at the door who's called the Tyler. As a secret society, masonry seeks to carefully guard its secrets and thus prohibits non-masons from being present within the lodge whenever lodge business is being conducted. Now, if it's not lodge business being conducted, they sometimes will have uh, social gatherings and their wives and children are welcome. They're even welcome to bring guests, bring visitors. They're, there are some Masonic lodges that will even invite the Boy Scouts to hold their meetings there and things like that, but not when a Masonic meeting is going on. If a Masonic meeting is going on and, be, and business is being conducted uh, and people being initiated with their rites and rituals, they have a man standing at the door to make sure nobody gets in the door that doesn't know the passwords. He's the Tyler. He's the mason commissioned by the local lodge to check the qualifications of anybody wishing to enter the lodge. He maintains a list of all members and visiting masons present for any meeting, and he is supposed to ensure that all masons wear their mandatory aprons when inside the lodge. So men, if your wife makes you wear an apron at home, that's not what we're talking about here. This is the Masonic apron, and you see those pictured down below. All three degrees of the Blue Lodge. The first three degrees of Freemasonry are all centered around a story that is recounted and acted out during the initiation into each of the three degrees. It is the story, the made-up story, of Hiram Abiff. Now, the story actually is loosely related to an actual man who's actually mentioned in the Bible. Uh, Hiram was the king of Tyre at the time that David was gathering the materials to build the temple. And then when he died, Solomon had the temple in Jerusalem built. King Hiram sent the building materials at the request of David and Solomon to be used in the construction of the first temple. And a man named Hiram whether it was King Hiram or another Hiram that he sent, a Hiram was very instrumental in, in construction of many of the things inside Solomon's temple. Even though he wasn't a Jew, he was a master craftsman and he was employed by King Solomon to complete some of the things inside uh, the, uh, the original temple there in Jerusalem, including especially two magnificent columns that are, significant, magni that are significant in Freemason mythology too. Central to the theme of the three degrees of the Blue Lodge is the myth of the death and resurrection of Hiram Abiff, the king of Tyre who the Bible says provided building materials and workers to help with the construction of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Additionally, he is credited by Masons 
with being the master mason in charge of the actual construction of the temple itself because of the work he oversaw recorded in Scripture, including two great pillars which bear the names of Jochen and Boaz. The myth of his resurrection is not only retold during the initiations into the three degrees of the Blue Lodge, but it is acted out as part of the rituals. The emphasis is not upon the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but upon the death, burial, and resurrection of this ecumenical secular figure, King Hiram of the city of Tyre. (coughs) Upon his completion of the third degree in the Blue Lodge, the initiate is said to be raised as a master mason, just as Hiram is said to have been raised from the dead by the masons at the building of King Solomon's uh, temple in Jerusalem. Now, there was a man named Hiram. He did help with the building of the temple. He was not killed, buried, and rose from the dead, as Freemasonry says. But I have heard more than one Mason tell me over the years, everything that we talk about is based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. No, it's not. It's not based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, for Jesus' resurrection is not discussed. It is the death, burial, and resurrection of a pagan secular figure, King Tyre, uh, uh, King Hiram of Tyre. In the third degree, in the three degrees of the Blue Lodge, the Mason's progress is referred to in three different stages by these terms. Initiated means he has passed the first degree as as an entered apprentice. Passed means he has passed the second degree as a fellow craftsman. Raised means that he has passed the third degree and is now a master mason. After he has been raised and is a master mason, he has completed the three degrees degrees of the Blue Lodge. That's all he can do in the Blue Lodge. That's as far as he can go. If he wants to go further in Masonry, Freemasonry, he has to choose one of those appendant bodies for the advanced degrees. He can choose the York Rite or the Scottish Rite. But he can't go any further just in the Blue Lodge. He can't go any farther than being a Master Mason. Here they are. Jake, here's what you were waiting for. No. The secret handshakes. The secret handshakes. This is one of the ways that Masons have of identifying each other when they're out in public. And not only identifying each other, but letting each other know how far along in the Blue Lodge they are. The entered apprentice handshake is the same as a regular handshake, except uh, the, the thumb of the man who is uh, uh, a first degree Mason he will place it on the first knuckle of the guy whose hand he's shaking. Now, you can tell just by the picture, that's not a normal looking handshake. It's a little bit awkward. And he does that though to place his thumb intentionally on that first knuckle. The average person is going to just think, hey, this guy's weird. He doesn't know how to shake hands. But to another mason... He immediately knows, hey, he's telling me he's an entered apprentice. Now I'm going to return the handshake. And if I am a, uh, a, a fellow craft, the second degree, I'm going to place my thumb on, the, on his second knuckle. And that lets him know I'm a degree ahead of him. If I'm a master mason, I'm going to make it, It's going to be a really awkward handshake, but I'm going to stretch my thumb out and put my thumb on his third knuckle, meaning I'm a mason of the third degree. Now, because this handshake looks very awkward out in public, a lot of times when masons are shaking hands with each other like this and they want to kind of camouflage it so other people looking around don't say, hey, that's odd looking. Uh, when, When they're shaking hands with somebody, they'll cover their hands like this while they're shaking hands so everybody else doesn't see how, un, how encumbersome it is what they're trying to do. But those are the secret handshakes. That's how they identify one another and what degree they are out in public without having to say anything. 
the lion's paw. This is another handshake. It's a grip. Also known as the strong grip of the master mason or the lion's paw, the grip of a master mason is used by the worshipful master of the lodge to raise a newly initiated master mason from quote-unquote death to life, literally raising him to his feet at the end of his initiation. He'll be on his knees, by the way, before he's raised. At this time, the initiate, kneeling at the lodge's altar of Freemasonry, and yes, there's an altar, is raised to his new life as a master mason by the, quote, strong grip of the lion's paw. Now that's an unusual looking handshake, to be sure. Uh, kind of looks like something that Mork from Ork would do. Uh, but when the master mason uh, is, when a fellow is being initiated as a master mason, he's on his knees, he's gone through the whole ritual now. The last step of the process there is the, the worshipful master of that lodge standing in front of him will reach down and take him by the hand with the strong grip of the lion's paw and pick him up to his feet. And he is now raised from death unto life as a master mason. I don't have time to go into the, their mythology behind the lion's paw. And it's related to the story of uh, the resurrection of Hiram Abith. And they claim it's related to Jesus being the, uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah. But I'm going to tell you for all of that that they want to tie into biblical analogies with Jesus, there are other analogies from pagan religions that tie much more closely to this initiation process than anything related to Jesus. This is uh, them attempting to tie it to Jesus is all made up. There are some other secret signs that the Masons use. Each of the first three degrees of masonry has a sign associated with it. And you can see up there on the board or you can watch me. I'm going to show you what they are. The first one is taking your hand with your thumb from one ear and drawing it in a line to the other ear. It is symbolic of the oath that they take when they are initiated as a first degree mason, which says, if I reveal any of the secrets of a mason... May my throat be cut from ear to ear. So that's one of the signs of a first degree mason. The, the sign of the second degree mason is looking like you're grabbing your heart and ripping it out. Because again, in keeping with the oath that's taken by a second degree mason, it's that if I reveal the secrets of masonry or I fail to keep any of my obligations as a mason, may my heart be ripped from my breast, and there's some other things I'll share with you later. And then the last one is the sign of a master mason, the third degree mason, and that is this. And what it is symbolic of is his vow that if he does not perform <clears throat> his obligations as a master mason like he has vowed to do, may he be sawn asunder, his bowels taken out, and some other things done to them that we'll talk about at a later time. The hidden hand of Freemasonry. How many of you have ever seen pictures of famous people with one hand stuck inside their coat? We, we all have, right? I mean, people from history all the way back hundreds of years in the same pose. Have you ever wondered why are all these famous people striking the same pose? Is it just because it looks noble? Well, there's more to it than that. Once advanced to the rank of Master Mason, a Mason earns the right and obligation to show his allegiance to the cause of Freemasonry by striking a pose with, quote, the hidden hand of Freemasonry on appropriate occasions. This is a signal to all other Master Masons that he is led by the high calling of Masonry. That is, he has no higher allegiance than he does to Masonry. All other allegiances are secondary to this one. The hidden hand is an occultic sign in and of itself. The word occult or occultic means hidden. You see on the far left there, there is uh, Karl Marx, the father of communism, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, my least favorite of all of them, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, 
and thank you for the booze, and then uh, Joseph Stalin. They all are bad guys, but they're also all Freemasons as well. Secret words. So they got secret handshakes, secret signs, and secret words. It almost uh, reminds me of the little rascals with their gang that they had the, uh, and the secret password they had to get into the clubhouse. Just as there are secret handshakes for the mason in each degree, and as he passes from one degree to the next, so too are there secret passwords that accompany each of those handshakes. An initiate must know both the handshake and the accompanying password in order to be accepted by fellow masons in his or other lodges. If a mason were to visit another lodge while he's on vacation or just traveling, and he wants to go into their meetings, if he's a master mason, he would be allowed to go into some other lodge, even if he's not a member of that lodge, provided he knows the right handshake and the password. The password for an accepted apprentice is Boaz. The password for fellow craft uh, is Shibboleth. The fellow craft, uh, once he's graduated, Jotkin. The master mason pass is Tubalcain, and the master mason password itself is Mahabon. We'll talk more about that later too. All of those are names, by the way, from the Bible, but they are names that have been misappropriated and given uh, occultic meanings that are not related to them from the Bible. They've taken biblical terms and given them pagan meanings. It is no different than what Roman Catholicism has done with taking the names of Bible people and beliefs and attributing them to pagan doctrines and pagan lore. No different at all. Here's the Masonic greeting. Upon being raised, quote unquote, from the dead during his initiation as a master mason, the initiate is promptly given the five points of fellowship by the worshipful master of the lodge or his designee who raises the initiate with the strong grip of the lion's paw and then he embraces him in the Masonic greeting. The five points of fellowship are foot to foot, knee to knee, chest to chest, hand to back, and mouth to ear as he whispers, Maha Bone. The initiate vows to never repeat the password except to a fellow mason and only in a low voice when greeting his fellow mason with the five points of fellowship. They're not supposed to do this for everybody else to see and hear what's going on, but it is one of the ways they identify themselves even out in public as long as they do it quietly. My time is almost up. We're almost finished for tonight. Don't give up on me just yet. Here's the Masonic distress signal. By the way, Masons are required to come to the rescue of a fellow Mason in distress. We'll talk more about that later too. The vows taken by Masons obligate them to come to the aid of any brother Mason who is in peril and asks for help. The Master Mason's vow expressly the, uh, expresses the obligation to respond to the universal Masonic distress signal thusly. I furthermore promise and swear that I will not give the grand hailing sign of distress except it be in cases of the most imminent danger or suffering in the cause of innocence and virtue. If I've been unduly charged with something, accused of something, in other words, or in a just and lawfully constituted lodge of master masons, or in a lodge for instruction, and when I see or hear it given by a worthy brother in distress, I will fly to the relief of him which gives it if there be a greater probability of saving his life than losing my own. What this means is that if you're a master mason, that is third degree or higher, you're making the commitment that if you see another mason giving the distress signal and you believe he is... Uh, He's innocent or he's, un he, he's been unjustly accused of whatever it is or he's in danger, you're required to come to his rescue no matter what else is going on, no matter what your other obligations are. Your number one obligation is to be to go rescue him out of whatever trouble he's in. The grand hailing distress signal is pictured here. I'm going to do it for you. Uh, here's the, the signal. It's 
the two hands down by the side and doing this three times. This is the grand hailing sign of distress. But if you can't do that in a public setting without it being noticeably awkward, there's another way you can give the sign of distress verbally. In the event that a mason is unable to give the signal without betraying it to others, he may instead utter the question loudly enough for other nearby masons to hear it and come to his aid by saying, O oh Lord my God, is there no help for the widow's son? Now the widow's son, again, relates back to the story of Hiram Abith, who was murdered and then resurrected from the dead in Masonic mythology. But if you ever hear somebody say something about, Oh Lord my God, is there no help for the widow's son? It, it sounds crazy, sounds odd, sounds strange, but he's letting any other Masons that might be in the room know, Hey, I'm a Mason and I'm in trouble. Some of you better come get me out of trouble. That's what he's letting them know. In plain sight, just as with the hidden hand of Freemasonry, the hand inside the coat, Masons have other hand signals that they use frequently right out in plain sight. And you see them all the time, by the way, in pop culture. These signals can be seen every day in magazines, movies, and television shows. To the average person, these signals mean nothing more than fad gestures. But to the initiated, they identify each other as fellow keepers of the secrets. Here's one of them right here. Uh, one of the more common hands... Uh, by the way, that's, anybody know who that is? Charles Darwin, father of evolution. One of the more common hand signals used in plain sight is a finger to the lips. The sign of the vow of silence. That is not to reveal any of the secrets of the initiated. That is the vow to keep the secrets of their secret societies. Not just Freemasonry, but any of the secret societies. This communicates to all other members of all other secret societies that he, as an individual, is a member of, quote, the club. He's in the club. He or she is proclaiming that he is faithful to his vow to keep the secrets of the mystery, that he is a loyal initiate of whatever secret society he is. It not only identifies his membership in the club, but also reiterates his fidelity to the cause of the secret fraternities and the mysteries they represent. You might not have ever seen this picture of Charles Darwin before with his finger to his lips, but I bet you've seen some pictures in newspapers, magazines, and television of lots of other celebrities and political figures making the same gesture. Here are just a few of them. This is making the gesture of the all-seeing eye. It is another Masonic reference. Uh, the all-seeing eye of Horus, we talked about that when we did our series on Mystery Babylon over a year ago, uh, from the Egyptian mystery religions. This hand signal symbolizes the belief in the third eye. That's the same thing the Hindus represent by that dot on their forehead that there's a third eye, that they are enlightened beyond the average person. The belief that the illuminated have had a special part of their understanding enlightened that separates them from the profane, the initiated, us, in other words. Here are some other examples of people throwing up signs with the, the all-seeing eye of Horus. It might be displayed by simply doing this or this, bringing emphasis to the one eye, or it could be by covering up one eye so that there's only one eye exposed. Both of them are ways of bringing attention to the all-seeing eye of Horus. And you see lots of different ways that they, they do this in uh, almost sneaky ways, but they're still getting their message across because anybody who's in the club knows what it means. Now you know what it means. Here's some others, and we could go on and on for two hours or better. We won't do that. The pineal gland in the brain, in the center of the brain there, you see a side cut of the pineal gland, and you see it looks identical to the Egyptian drawing of the eye of Horus. 
We talked about this when we did our series on Mystery Babylon previously too. Don't have time to go through all that tonight. But the pineal gland in the brain looks like the Egyptian eye of Horus. That's not a coincidence when a cross-section of the brain is viewed. It is this part of the brain that the occult and secret societies claim opens like a lotus flower on the inside of your brain or uh, like a lotus flower or a mature pine cone when the individual becomes truly enlightened. The New Age movement, Buddhism, Hinduism, all of the mystery religions use pine cones, the lotus flower, to symbolize the, the, the doctrine of being enlightened. And who do they think the enlightenment comes from? The serpent. That's part of the mythology too we don't have time to go into tonight. That's why in, the, in, the, in Vatican City you see lots of big pine cones. It's because it's all paganism. It's all pagan mystery religions. Uh, there is uh, uh, Angor Wat in Southeast Asia. Uh, other places too. The, the ancient Babylonians, the Assyrians, today's Hindus, Buddhists, and Roman Catholics all use these same symbols that are the same symbols used in Freemasonry as well. Here are some of the other symbols of Freemasonry. Uh, if I had the time tonight, I could tell you how every one of those is associated with the ancient worship at the Tower of Babel and mystery Babylon from ancient times, which is coming full circle and is right now everywhere around us in pop culture. But I don't have time to do that tonight. So what do Masons believe about Freemasonry? All right, I'm coming to a close tonight. What do the Masons themselves believe about their organization? The average Mason believes the following. Number one, it's an honorable institution. Number two... He believes it's not at odds with being a Christian. Number three, he believes it does not conflict with Scripture. Number four, he believes it does not require a Christian to compromise. Number five, he believes it presents truth to initiates and not lies. Are these things true? You're about to see for yourself. I want to give this challenge before we close tonight. You may not be a Mason here tonight, but any Mason that's watching this or listening to it, before you go any further, my challenge is this. If you're a Mason listening to this presentation, here's the challenge. Ask some of the older Masons in the lodge, or go online and ask some, to name some of the most respected authorities in Freemasonry on the symbols and meaning of the degrees of the craft. Ask some of the older Masons, who do I, who do I read in our organization to find out what all our stuff means. Compare the list of respected authorities that they, that they will give you by name to those that we're going to quote throughout the rest of this presentation. In so doing, you will realize that we have not chosen obscure sources that nobody's ever heard of, but rather the same respected names that are respected within Freemasonry in order to present an accurate picture of the craft of Freemasonry. What I'm saying here is that from the rest of this point on, when you come next week, you've heard tonight and you've seen tonight just the light stuff, just the easy stuff, the baby stuff. You've heard the secrets that everybody's already heard about Freemasonry, but you wanted to know. Next week, Here's our topic for next week. The secrets that most Masons don't want you to know. The stuff that we learned tonight, they don't want you to know it, but it's not the big stuff. The stuff we're going to talk about next week, we're going to talk about by using the words of their own authorities. And it's stuff that the average Mason does not want anybody that's not a Mason to know goes on in the Masonic Hall. Masonic Lodge. If you think you learned something tonight that you didn't know, it's nothing compared to what we're going to talk about next week. We haven't gotten to the big stuff yet. The really big stuff. 
I hope you'll be here next week. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you take this study. Lord, may we not in any way learn the things we learn, study the things we study, just for the sake of having a head knowledge. And may we not think we're better than anyone. But dear God, may we realize that just as we have been saved out of things in our own lives, so too we have people all around us that need to be delivered from things perhaps in their own lives. Some that are not yet saved and need to be born again. But others who are already Christians and should know better than to be involved with the things they're involved in. Oh dear God, may you use this with the right spirit from us to prick their hearts and cause them to consider whether they are what and who they ought to be for you. And may they put you first. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.